Ecclesiastes chapter 4. I think I've got one more message on this. And I'm going to, let me say this as we get into the scriptures. Um, when I started this last Sunday morning and started preaching about the threefold cord of the family. I, I, I think I said it last Sunday, but I'm going to, I'm going to reassure it this morning. I understand that not every home is perfect. I understand that my own home is not perfect and never has been. One of the things that I hope that we understand about one another here at church is that we dare not expect perfection out of anybody because perfection belongs only to God. But what He did for us was he, he tries, by teaching us things, to make our life better. And it's like, it's like Lynn said, Lynn, I appreciate you saying what you said. Because, I mean, I, I can't preach to Sister Lynn and uh, Sister uh, Betty Walsh and, and Sister Linda and others about having the perfect family with the husband and wife and the children because there's no husband. But what God takes out, He supplies better with Himself in that position. And, I mean, I've, I've, I've got some. I've, I'll probably hope to try to remember it this morning while I'm preaching. Even for those who don't have children, is not God better than any children that you could have? That's biblical. It's scripture. God always fills in the voids and the gaps that this world takes out of our lives. God always puts back in better than it ever was before. So... When I preach about families and homes and, and raising children, I'm not preaching down my nose at anybody. I'm not condemning anybody for any situation they're in. But that we take the bumps and the things that happen in our life, understanding that God was there the whole time and He's there to make what we go through better than it could be without Him. So, no, I'm not trying to preach on having perfect families because there is no such thing. What I'm trying to preach to you is that the strength of your life will always be family. You have a father in heaven. If you had, if you had no dad on this earth or had a lousy dad on this earth, You've got a father who is better than that. If you've never had a brother in your life, you've got one who sticks closer than a brother. If you have lost your husband or do not have a husband, you have one who is the bride or the bridegroom of the church of Jesus Christ. And that is Jesus Christ himself. You have God to supply all of your need in your life. Is that not why we're here? Somebody say amen. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9. Two are better than one. Two are better than one. Because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So I want us to pray this morning as we remember the threefold cord of what 
is the basis for any civilization. And that is how it treats the institution of marriage and the institution of children. Uh, turn to Deuteronomy 28 and then let's go to the Lord in prayer and I'm going to show you something. That's not in my notes. Deuteronomy 28. I'm going to preach on children this morning. And this will apply to grandchildren as well, or great-grandchildren. Deuteronomy 28. Once you get there, rest yourself and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I come before you today, God, and I do not know how to preach this message the right way. God, the greatest, the greatest thing that you've ever done for me, along with my salvation, was giving me children. Because then I learned, I learned more about you than I ever did in Bible college. More than the theology text manual wrote up about who God is. I learned it through my children. They taught me my relationship with you, your relationship with me. Father, I love my children so much. And I love my grandchildren. And Father, I've made one mistake after another. And they have too. But Father, your grace has been manifested throughout all of it. And I'm very thankful for that, Father. I thank you, God, that the way I see my family... is a small way of how you see us. For we are your children. We are your offspring. And Father, we're living in a society where children are no longer a blessing. They're a curse. And that's because Families and men and women have forsaken you and forsaken your laws and your commandments and your judgments. They've turned against that. And their children are not a blessing. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would help us to see this thing the way you see it. Help us to understand why you have given us children, why you've given us grandchildren what they are, what they represent. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be able to convey that to all those who listen, despite my poor way of presenting it. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would humble us all and help us to realize, God, that you're here for us to use us in whatever way, Father, that you want to use us. And we thank you, dear God, for binding us together in families. No greater blessing than that. We even call each one here brother and sister. And Father, we mean that. There are people in this church that are far closer to us than even our own kin. And we value that and we treasure that. And Father, as we would, we would hate to lose people out of our own family, help us, dear God, to grieve at the thought of losing one person out of this church. So Father, help us to treat each other as family. Help us to love one another as brothers and sisters. Help us, dear God, to defend one another to stand for one another, to help one another, to care for one another, and to pray for one another, while those pray for us and defend us and stand for us. 
Bless our families and bless us as a family. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. In Deuteronomy 28, God made a covenant with the people of Israel. And here's what He said. In verse 2, God said, All these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Then he said, Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. And then in verse 4, look at what he said. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body. The fruit of thy body is children. God is in the business of... Of giving us children as a blessing. Children, not only to ourselves, but grandchildren. And I, I was talking to the man that uh, he came this uh, this week. He was with our insurance company. He came to inspect the building, make sure everything was okay. And we both agreed, we are about the same age, and we both agreed that we should have skipped the children and went right to the grandchildren. Would have been a whole lot more fun. Amen. My daughters will come in every now and then and say, Dad... Now, so-and-so, they've been bad. They don't get no candy. I said, that's fine. Don't give them any. That doesn't apply to grandpa has rights and he has superpowers. Amen. But even with the idea that those of us who choose to join ourselves in a church body, we see each other's. Number one, God is all of us. He is our father. He brought us again into this world. We are born again. Think about that term. The idea of salvation means born again. Born in the family of God. God has saw fit to, when He brings us into His kingdom, brings us as His children. So that we see God as our Father and we see one another as brothers and sisters. Now, brothers and sisters, I've had a sister... Sometimes we didn't like each other. And when we fought, our fights tasted like castor oil. If you've never had castor oil in your mouth. Whew! But when we fought, my mom set us down, not with a tablespoon, or not a teaspoon, a tablespoon, a ladle. Full of castor oil with that sliding down our throat and said, every time you fight, it's going to taste like castor oil. Hated that stuff. But I love my sister. And I'd do anything in the world for her. And I love my brothers and my sisters. And I would do anything in the world for you. Because God saw fit to bring us into this world and into His kingdom. And He did that by birthing us as children in His kingdom. I'm saying to you this morning that when God is first in our lives, God blesses the fruit of our body. He blesses us with children. Somebody say amen. Now look at verse 15. Here's the opposite. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all His commandments and His statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shalt thou be in the city. Cursed shalt thou be in the field. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. And then verse 18. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body. And I don't think it's so much where God is cursing them to where they don't have children. I think God is laying a curse on them in such a way as they no longer see children as the blessing that they really are. And I think we've gotten, we should have woken up in 1973 when our country had abandoned God so bad that God allowed our Supreme Court judges to legalize murder of unborn children in this country. You want to get me fired up and stirred up over something, it will be that. It's murder. It represents the idea that children are a curse. 
Why is it that women say that they go to get an abortion? Is it really because of the reasons they say? Or is it because they don't want a child messing up their life right now? They don't want the inconvenience of the most precious gift that God can give us from heaven. They don't want that inconvenience. Now, I'm going to temper that by saying, there are people listening to me who have had an abortion. If God can forgive me, He can forgive anybody. And I mean that. But I just, I have to preach certain things. And I'm saying to you this morning that we've gotten in such a case in this country by turning away from God that children, even if we allow them to be born, they are a curse even to their parents. Their parents treat the children like they're getting in the way of their lifestyle. Daddies won't come home at night to be with their children. Mamas won't treat their children right. I was doing a side job years ago working on the basement of a house at a subdivision south of St. Louis somewhere in the neighborhood. And I'll never forget, man, I wanted to come unglued on this lady. This woman, she had a teenage daughter in her house. And I don't know what this girl did, but this mother let out curses and curses to her daughter's face. And I wanted to grab her and pop her, not the daughter, the woman. I wanted to pop her in the mouth and say, how dare you talk that way to your child? Now, I know, I know teenagers, I know they can get off hand, I know there's a way to deal with it. Cursing your children is not from God, and it's not right. And if you look at your Bible, that's exactly what happens. They were cursed in the fruit of their body. Their own children were a curse to them. Moms and dads who live such scandalous lifestyles that they don't think anymore of the effect that that has on their children or even their grandchildren anymore. They care nothing about it. They go out, they whore around, they drink, they do drugs. God forbid that we legalize recreational marijuana in this state. Amen. That's going to destroy any chance this state has of getting right with God. Think of your children next time you go to do something stupid. And let me just say this. Psalm, turn to Psalm chapter 2. Let's look at this again very quickly. If you will give me... I, I let people uh, give their testimonies and I appreciate that. If you'll let me have some time this morning to preach this and to get this out of me. I'm telling you, I cannot, I cannot say enough to you this morning of what God did in my life through my children. Everything that I fought against, every part of me that I had to fight and try to work through, I did it for my wife and I did it for my children. And children ought to be seen then as the blessing from God that they really are. And not something that gets in the way of us. I commend certain people in this church for the way that you have handled your children. Without saying names, there are people sitting in this room that I think highly of because you have sacrificed and you have given, you have changed yourself for the sake of your child. And I say thank you for that. Praise God that God put that in your heart. But look at your Bible. In Psalm chapter 2, verse 2, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. 
there is no doubt in my mind an attack in this country, an attack on the family unit. I knew we were in trouble years ago. We used to have a daycare center and we had to have a certain amount of state licensing to go with that. And so I went with the daycare workers to this mandatory training that they had out at uh, University of Missouri. And I knew we were in trouble when the man who was teaching a course, I don't know what he was teaching about, and I don't know where in the world this came from, but it just shows you the liberal agenda. He started out by saying, I want to define for everybody here what a family is. And he said, a family is a group of people that love each other. What he was denying was the basic family unit was that of a husband, not just a man, not an unmarried, unpromised man, but a husband, a man who swore an oath, a man that made a promise. That he would work and strive to keep his family together. A wife, not a girlfriend, not a live-in, not a shack-up, not another man. A wife who also made a lifelong commitment, a promise to do and make the sacrifices necessary to keep the family together. Then... Them, with God giving them the grace and the ability to bring forth children, either by birth or by adoption, but to bring forth children, that to me, that to God, is what a family is. But see, the liberal agenda says, oh, let's just get three or four, uh, three or four men, and let's let them start adopting. Let me tell you about the first ever homosexual male couple that was allowed to adopt children in Australia. Those two men right now are in prison for life because they fought, they got the laws changed, they wanted to adopt children, the state bowed to them, allowed them to raise children, and from the very moment they took this six-month-year-old boy in their home, they molested him. And ceased not to do that. We're foolish in this country if we think that we can redefine what God has defined for us. So God said in Genesis 2, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife. Forgive me for doing that, but if I don't, I'll blow it all over the church house. Shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now that's not just the uniting of the man and the woman together as one, but the one flesh that is the product of that man and that woman is their child. Their born child. And by the way, I'm going to throw this in as well. We now live in the age where a child can have three or four or five or multiple parents. And I'm not just talking about on paper. I'm talking about genetic parents. That, as far as I'm concerned, is an abomination. If God wanted me to have three daddies, He would have incorporated it into the Garden of Eden. We're, we're, we're standing against God. Let me move on. Psalm 127, I want you to turn there. Took me a while to me, for me to learn what this meant. But I heard a preacher preach on it and I like it. Look at your Bible. Psalm 127 verse 3. Let me show you the importance. And I want to say this to every man and woman in this church. Look at these children. Not just your own. But the children that are in this church. Let me tell you how it was from my point of view, when I used to be that little boy sitting in the pews. I highly regarded the men and the women that were in this church. God set that in my heart. Jared, you know what I'm talking about. When Jared was a little boy, he went to church, he saw the same thing. We looked up to these men. They were our heroes. They were the men that in our eyes could do no wrong. 
They were the men who were our Sunday school teachers. They were the men who came together to make decisions for the church. They were the men... That when they fought each other in the church, that hurt me. It hurt me. Because these men were my heroes. I don't know if you've noticed. We don't have a lot of business meetings in this church. And it's not because I think I can run everything. God knows I can't. But I just have decided that we ought not get together and fight over every little thing that goes on in God's house. It ain't right. These children, what they need to see is some adults in God's house who act like adults in God's house. We teach, I was taught you don't run in here. You don't chew your gum, stick it under the pew. You don't throw your candy papers on the floor. I got some left. I better not see it on the floor afterward. Okay? But there's rules for adults as well in God's house. And we do these things to set an example for these little guys. Is that right? Psalm 127, verse 3, look at your Bible. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. They are a gift given to us. They are what we are going to leave behind in this world. And if you want anything said about you at your funeral, let it be said that you tried your best to raise children who loved the Lord, who respected right and wrong, who knew how to dress in public, who knew how to get up and go to work at 6 o'clock in the morning or 5 o'clock in the morning. Who knew how to keep a job. Who knew how to, to take on the responsibility that society lays on us. That that man, when he's in that casket or that woman, it can be said of them, look, you can see their life through their children. Children are in heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is His reward. Look at your Bible. In fact... The greatest thing that God ever did in this world was send Jesus Christ. But how did he send him? In a spaceship coming down from the sky? He sent him to this earth as a baby being born. A child. The greatest gift that God has ever given to this world was in the form of a child, my people. Listen to your Bible. Now watch this, verse 4. As arrows, I like this. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. Now, I will say that some men's quivers not as big as other men's quivers. I mean, you might have only two children, but that's enough for you. Some men and ladies, you might have a dozen, and then that be enough for you. I wonder what Madeline and Cameron, I wonder how many children they're going to have. How many of y'all want? <laughs> Little brothers back there going. <laughs> Give them ten, Jesus. Give them ten. One for each commandment. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> now watch this. I want to show you what this means. If you don't like the condition of the town that you live in, if you don't like the condition of the county you live in, if you don't like the condition of the state that you live in or the country, you have a weapon. You have a weapon. It's called your children. He said, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are the children of the youth. Happy is a man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with his enemies in the gate. That means the enemies show up and you're standing there like this going, can I help you? Is there anything you want to do here? Because we're, we've been ready for you for a long time. Now, we can become friends very quickly if you want, or you can remain enemies, but we've been ready for you for years. Which way is it going to be? You say, that's not Christian. I'm looking at it right here in the Bible. 
He shall speak with his enemies at the gate. In other words, you don't have to let them in. I've got a quiver full of arrows. Now watch this. You take a child. I want you to listen to your preaching now. I'm going to preach Bible to you. And understand. These, some of these things I haven't done very well myself. But I still have to say them because they're right. God gave us these children. You can either let the world destroy them. Or you can turn them into the sharpest weapon against the evils that are going on in this world. So you take those children. Give it, tell God thank you. You take those children from a young age and train them. Not yell at them, train them. Teach them what's right and what's wrong. Even if you do it yourself, do what's wrong, you teach your children what daddy did was wrong. Don't try to act perfect to your kids. They'll see right through it. They know better. This is right and this is wrong. And when they're ready, you take those children, turn them loose, and let them be right in the face of your enemies as you send those well-sharpened, well-polished children out into the world who are ready to take God's way into a lost and dying world. Amen. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O Lord God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. You train your children to tr not trust government, not depend on government, but to trust and depend on God. That's how you teach them. You teach them, you let them see the mistakes that you have made in your life and then train them, son, daughter, don't do what I did. Don't get caught up in this crowd. Don't hang around these people. Don't be like what you see in school. Be better than that. Boom! The, 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 the devil can't stand it. it turn, uh, let, me, uh, let me move through this. Notice here, Exodus chapter 1, Matthew chapter 2, and Revelation chapter 12. Three examples. Of how the devil, in order to stop what God was going to do, went after the children to do it. In Moses' day, tried to have all the children killed. In Jesus' day, tried to have all the children killed. In Revelation chapter 12, he's standing before the woman ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it's born. Hey, I know some of you people. You've told me your story. I know some things that's happened to you when you were children. Do you not understand what the devil was trying to do to you 20, 30 years ago? How he tried to mess you up and get you in bondage at the youngest age possible? You know what that ought to do? That ought to make you mad. That ought to make you mad and say, you know what? That's not happening. Devil, you get back away from my kids. I, hey, moms, turn into she-bears. Amen. Now, turn to uh, Psalm 78. Psalm 78. Thank God for allergy season. Amen. That means stuff's going to grow. Amen. Psalm 78. Look at your Bible. Mm -mm -mm. Psalm 78 verse 2 I will open my mouth in a parable and I will utter dark sayings of old which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us we will not hide them from our children look at your Bible we will not hide them from our children 
You teach your children anything, you teach them to know God's Word. Because what's going to happen to them when they go to the school and they're taught that they came from monkeys and fish? What happens to them? They think there's no God. They don't believe in God anymore. So they think they can turn their back on what mom and daddy taught them, what they learned in Sunday school. They think they can turn their back on that. No, you teach them from the youngest age possible that God is their creator. Remember the creator in the days of thy youth, Solomon said. So we, we will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make known to their children. That the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born. Look at that. He's telling you to get it in your mind that even though they're not born yet, get ready to teach them that. Wouldn't it be something? Wouldn't it be something if these children in this church turned this country around for God? Who said it couldn't be done? Who said it couldn't be done? That the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. The worst, the worst thing that can happen to your child is that not that, that, not that they get in an accident, not that something happens and they get killed or they get hurt. The worst thing that can happen to your child is for them to forget God. Yeah. And you know what, moms and dads? Just because they're over 18, that does not mean that your job is done. In fact, you're just getting wound up. You still have an influence on them, especially when they need money. <laughs> Amen? Oh, uh, yeah, you need your car fixed. I'll tell you what, be here for Sunday school. <laughs> And I'll write you a check. Turn to Psalm 144. I'm going to show you how God sees this thing. Can I have a couple more minutes? Listen, the restaurants will still have plenty of food. Psalm 144. Man, it hurts me. When I see children, and I mean children... Children. Girls, six and seven years old, dressed like sluts. Boys, who have already watched so much sex on TV and the internet. It will, it will follow them the rest of their life. The Bible calls them strange children. What that means is they are not born of the same way that we're born. And I want to say this. Number one, I would be very careful about who you let your child run with. I found out that what I could not do at my house, I could do at my friend's house. I'm just not going to tell you what it was. Because my mom might listen. <laughs> I just heard my mom say, son, I knew it 30 years ago, I knew it. So, Psalm 144, verse 11, Rid me and deliver me from the hand of strange children. Pray over your children. God, please, protect my children from strangers and from strange children. It's not that we want our children to be superior than everybody else. It's not that. It's just that we don't want them screwed up in the head before they even turn 11 years old. 
Well, you got to let your children socialize. And I, Listen, I know what that means. They don't like the way you're raising your children because they think you're all uppity against them and so on, and they want you to feel guilty. Don't, don't let that phase you. <sighs> Rid me and deliver me from the hand of strange children whose mouths speak of vanity. <sighs> children. Children at basketball games who say the worst things imaginable. Children do. Their mouth speaketh vanity and their right hand is the right hand of falsehood. You know what the right hand represents? The book in Revelation 5 is in God's right hand. So here is the lost generation and their hand is full of falsehood. It's full of the lies of the public school system. Amen? It's full of the lies of evolution, full of the lies of all this gender mix-up garbage that's going on. It's full of those kind... Well, I'm going to let my child decide what gender they want to be. God, God decided that! God did that! It's full of that stuff. You have in your ability to turn children out into this world whose right hand is full of truth. And when they're old, they will not depart from it. And you know what, moms and dads? You say, well, my kid got away. They're, they're not dead yet. There's still hope. There's still hope. Now look at verse 12. That our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth. That verse I quoted a while ago. Blessed is a man that walketh not. In, hey, p- parents, train your sons to be this way. Number one, son, do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Do not let people tell you their morality. You learn your morality from the Bible. Amen. Blessed is the man that standeth in the way of sinners. Son, if you see all the sinners going over here, don't go over there. Son, if you see the sinners going off to this entertainment, don't go to that entertainment. If you see all the sinners listening to this music, then don't listen to that music. Don't watch that show. Don't read those books. Stay away from that stuff. Nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Son, they will make fun of you. They will chas- They will try to call you names. They will, they will sissify you. They will try to make you into something you're not because you believe in God. Don't listen to that garbage. Son, be proud that God is your God. But His delight, His delight is in the law of the Lord. In the law of the Lord. And in His law does He meditate day and night. Therefore, that, now that verse a while ago said that our sons may be as plants growing up in their youth. Here it says that he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. I want my children. I don't care how much money they make. What I care about is that my children and my grandchildren love God. Love God. Now our daughters, this is where it's at. Listen to this. And that our daughters may be as cornerstones, polished after similitude of a palace. When you think of a cornerstone, what do you think of? Huh? Jesus Christ. Did you see, do you see that? Our daughters, listen to this. Our daughters become part of the foundation of God's church. Listen to it. Guys, you know what what I think about the ladies in our church? If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have this church. I can tell you that right now. And I'm not just talking about, well, they keep it clean and tidy and they decorate it nice. I'm not talking about that. God given our ladies a spirit of godly counsel 
You see, us men, we get together and we go to decide things that will benefit the church. And I trust these men. But I also know that behind each man in that council is a woman who will counsel her husband on what she thinks is right. And we could have a church full of little mouthy Jezebels. Now, when you get in that board meeting, I want you to make sure that this happens. Because if it don't happen, then I'll tell you what, there's not going to be peace in our church. Because if this don't happen the way I want it, then we're not going to have fun. You know what? I've seen that in this church in my youth. I saw a woman stand up in a business meeting and slap in the face the most godly deacon I've ever known in my life. Because the woman was a little Jezebel and her husband sat right there and let her do it. You think I'm going to let that go on here? But I want to tell you, ladies, we couldn't do it without you. And I don't want to. Notice that it says, a polished cornerstone. You know what that means? It takes work. It takes work to make our daughters polished cornerstones. Don't just, well, they're 13, they don't do what I say anyway. Then you tan the hide off of them. They ain't too old, and that's not abuse. However God leads you to do it, polish those cornerstone girls so that the next generation of Bethel Church lives on for the Lord. My heart has been in this church my whole life. At some point, I'm not going to be here no more. What is the next generation of Bethel Church going to be like? I mean, look around you. We got people from all walks of life. We got something that ain't never been done before. Blacks and whites sitting in together, loving one another. We've got some things good here. But it takes work to keep it polished. So let's polish our cornerstones. And let's get rooted, our young men, in the Word of God. Amen? I tell you what I want to do. I want to have a prayer time for our families and our children. Okay? So... You children. Hey, all the kids, look right here. Look. Right right here. Look at me for a second. You're fixing to see a bunch of adults get out on their knees. I want you to remember for the rest of your life that they were praying for you. Because something's going to hit you in about 10 years. It's going to try to kill you. And you'll remember that there were some people who loved you to pray for you to get through that so you could take our place. Let's come and pray.